Hi everyone, so today we're doing um, 26.3 more about alpha, beta and gamma radiation. So, um, just want you to think about how can you use a chemistry technique to determine the structure of an alpha radiation. So some of you doing chemistry might have uh, seen something like this before. What we've got here is a, a glass chamber. Um, and then we have some mercury here which will compress some alpha gas. Um, the gas is then put inside the glass chamber and there's a, a thin glass tube here and then what you have is a high voltage unit across here with this gas okay and then it's used to determine the structure of the alpha inside so I'm just to get you to think about how you do that while I go through the learning objectives they are to describe what happens to the nucleus in radioactive decay Describe how the intensity of gamma radiation changes as it spreads out and explain how to represent the change in the nucleus when it emits alpha, beta or gamma radiation. So going back to this diagram, um, this is how you do it. So the alpha particles have the same structure as a helium nucleus, so this is trying to determine that. So the alpha particles collected in the gas tube and then a voltage is t uh, turned on the gas um, and it conducts electricity and it will produce light. Okay. You can then use a spectrometer, um, and that, if you think back from to the quantum physics topic, that's that spectrum that's produced in the spectrometer can be used to prove that alpha gas has the same spectrum as another element, and it happened to be a tube filled with helium. So this discovery took place um, before the nuclear model was established, and. After that, we knew that the alpha particle contains two protons and two neutrons. So having a look at beta radiation. Beta radiation um, consists, it occurring from radioactive sources, consists of fast moving electrons. Um, they were proven by measuring deflection of beta particles using electric and magnetic fields, and they were same, found to have the same specific charge as electrons, i.e. in a in a magnetic field, they moved in the same way as electrons. Okay, what it is is the weak nuclear force changing a neutron into a proton and an electron, which we've done before. The weak nuclear force can also change a proton into a positron and a neutron, so that's beta plus decay. So we did that in the um, quantum physics topic right at the start of AS. And these are the diagrams that go with that, and you can see the quark, quark change here. So for beta minus decay, you've got a down quark change into an up quark, releasing your electron, which is the lepton, and then the anti-neutrino to conserve lepton number. Uh, in beta plus decay, you've got the up dark quark changing into a down quark, releasing a positron, and then you've got the um, neutrino released to, again to conserve lepton number. In both cases, the messenger particle is a boson, and then negative and positive charge, depending on if it's beta minus or beta plus decay. Let's have a look at gamma radiation. So, just looking at the diagrams at the top here, here you've got um, a gamma source that's emitted in all directions. It's inside a lead container with a gap, so that you get a narrow beam produced. But no matter how narrow the beam, it will actually begin to spread out. Okay, so not only does the detector, the Geiger tube, not pick up all the radiation because it's in one direction um, and actually it's released in all directions, but you're only collecting it in one direction, but also the, um, the actual gamma radiation is spread out once it reaches the Geiger tube. You then take that to a scalar counter, which is basically the counter that counts the radiation. And then this is showing you that the radiation is spreading out over an area. So if you imagine this is you standing inside a sphere, it's a 3D sphere, so it actually comes out as well as to the sides, okay? It's like you standing in the middle of a beach ball. So if you're in the middle of a beach ball and beach balls around you, the radiation hits every part of that surface, okay? So it's not a flat surface area, it's a 3D surface area. Now, gamma radiation consists of photons of wavelengths 10 to the minus 11 or less. Um, the discovery of gamma radiation was used by using a crystal to diffract a beam of radiation in a similar way to light. So you just use a crystal with a really small gap in it, and it will perform diffraction. 
Um, it follows an inverse square law. So the intensity of the radiation, so the intensity is equal to the radiation per second in unit area. So in a unit area, in unit surface area, we want to know how much radiation is arriving per second. And a point source emits n photons per second, and each of those will have an energy HF. So the energy of one photon is HF, and the source will be emitting n photons. The total amount of energy being released by the source will be n times HF, the number of photons times the energy of each photon. So that will give you the radiation energy per second. If the because n is the number of photons per second, okay, not the total number. If you then move a distance d from the source here, the photons emitted from the source pass through an area of 4 pi r squared. Now that is the surface area of the sphere I was talking about. If you were standing inside the middle of the beach ball, the photons are hitting a surface area, 3d surface area, the 4 pi r squared. So that's the surface area of a sphere. So the intensity is the radiation per second, so nhf, in unit area, so divided by 4 pi r squared. So here we go, intensity is radiation energy per second divided by the area, nhf divided by 4 pi r squared. The number of photons emitted per second, h, the frequency of the photons, 4 and pi are all a constant for a given source. So that means that you get the intensity is equal to a constant k over r squared. And this is called an inverse square law. So if the intensity at an initial radius r0 is i0, if you double r0, the intensity will be a quarter of what you originally have, because 2 squared is 4, so you get a quarter of the energy. If you're then at a distance 3 times as far, 3 squared is 9, so your intensity goes down by 9. Lots of things follow this inverse square law, uh, including sound, so you can test this yourself. If you get a speaker and stand a metre away, okay, and then you double your distance, so you stand 2 metres away, the amount of sound you hear will be a quarter as, as much. Then if you triple your distance, so you go three metres away from it, then you will hear a ninth of it. That's why if someone's having a party next door, it sounds really, really loud, but if you're further away, then it sounds quieter. So if you want to verify the inverse square law for a gamma source, which you, we will have to do this as a required practical, um, you use a guide counter to measure the count rate C at different distances. Now the count rate is how many photons are hitting the actual source per second. It's not the whole of the radiation being emitted from the source, because remember you're only collecting it in one direction. Okay. First of all, I really should have put this first actually, you measure the background count rate and we call that C0, so that's without the source present. And then the count rate with the source is called C. We then calculate something called the corrected count rate, which is just, just the count rate that's definitely from the source. So you use C minus the background, and that will give you the um, corrected count rate, so taking off the background radiation. So you know that the, what you're getting is just from your source. And we, we, we say that that's proportional to the intensity of the radiation. So We've no C minus C naught, that's the corrected count rate. We've got our K constant, which we talked about before. And then we've got this distance squared, but it says D plus D naught. And if I go back to the original page, the problem with the distance is the source is actually inside a container. And so this little extra bit called D naught, which is the size of the container. So the distance away would be D naught plus D. So this r squared becomes d0 plus d. So we now have our term. If we want to verify it, though, we need to plot it on a graph, our results on a graph. So how are we going to do that? We want a straight line. And if we get a straight line, then we're verifying that this is true. But it's got a squared term in, so it wouldn't necessarily give us a straight line straight away. 
and the thing that we're measuring is c minus c naught. So to get rid of the square, okay, take the square root. So here we go. So you've got c minus c naught is to the power half is the square root of this. That gets rid of the square. Want to plot a graph of y equals mx plus c? Just for ease of plotting, I'm going to make y the sub, uh, d the subject, so y. So I need to rearrange this for d. Okay. And what you end up getting when you rearrange it, just take the d over and divide by this. Okay. So you need to take the d plus d naught over, sorry, and then the d naught comes back to this side. If you're not sure how to rearrange this, I'll arrange a Google Meet to show you. But basically, this is the rearrangement. If you compare it to y equals mx plus c, on the y-axis you plot d. The x -axis, uh, so the gradient will be a constant. x, you plot 1 over the square root of the correct account rate. And then you have this term minus d naught. When you plot it on a graph, it looks like this. And you can see the y-intercept here, minus d naught. That will tell you how big your container is, just there. Or it should. Okay, we do do a uh, required practical on this, so you will um, get to see this in action. Just as a reminder, then, from um, the first topic in alpha emission, okay, the alpha particle has 4 to alpha. So if you have a particle x, you take 4 away from the top number and 2 away from the bottom number, and it will give you your particle here. So, for example, 150, 100 take away 4 is 96, and 50 take away 2 is 48. Okay, so your uh, new daughter uh, isotope is here, and then you have the 40. And just as a check, 96 plus 4 makes 100, and 48 plus 2 makes 50. In beta emission, which again we did in um, chapter 1, you should be able to do this a so beta minus you have um, a stays the same because there's no um, protons and neutrons and then z you plus one to get the isotope and you release the negative beta and the antineutrino so 100 stays the same and then it's z plus one so 51 minus one makes 50 and then beta plus is the opposite, so you're going to take away 1. So if we look here, 100 stays the same, and 50 minus 1 is 49, plus 1 makes 50. If you can't remember doing that, you can look back in Chapter 1 of your AS book. There's just another type, uh, we did talk about electron capture as well. So some proton-rich nuclei can capture an inner shell electron and causes a proton in the nucleus to change into a neutron the emission of electron neutrino at the same time so this is what's going on here the isotope releases an um, adds an electron on and so so you lose a proton at the bottom and you get a neutrino so again 50 minus 1 is 49 the top number stays the same your protons turned into a neutron. You also have gamma emission. No change occurs in the number of protons and neutrons of a nucleus when it emits gamma, because gamma um, photon is emitted if the nucleus has extra energy after it's emitted an alpha or beta minus particle. So what I want you to do are these questions, these summary questions on 26.3. Um, if you, a lot of you email me and say you're struggling with any of the questions or that concept of rearranging the equation for the graph, I'll set up a Google Meet and show you how to do it. Okay, so um, I'll have a go at the questions, see how we go. Thank you. Bye.